She is at Smith College. She's a professor of engineering and director of the Pickard Engineering Program. Her area is electrical engineering, focusing on speech and hearing. And there's one phrase I got here. She got an award for acoustic energy flow through normal and abnormal middle ears. So she contributed to the design of hearing aids, I guess. She had a BS at Brown, an MS at MIT, and a PhD, which seems to be the joint Harvard MIT thing, as near as I can tell from the website. Is that right? Well, that's, that's pretty good. In spite of all of that, kind of the credential I'm most jealous of, uh, which is high up in the United States Olympic trial for sailing. Oh, huh. <laughs> talk to us about that. Reading the humanities and sciences, story of engineering at Smith College. Thank you. So um, thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Diane and Dan, for inviting me to talk to you about what we've been doing at Smith. It's been really fun to put this talk together. I've certainly um, spoken about pieces of it, but I've never actually put a talk together like the one you're about to see. So it's been fun to think about and to talk to my colleagues about things I might include in it and to just figure out what would be of interest to this wider community. And I'm looking forward to sharing that with you and also to hearing more about what's going on at other similar institutions. So um, I'm going to start very briefly talking about my background and Smith College in general and then more detail on how our program came about and why folks decided engineering made a lot of sense at Smith College before my time for the most part. Um, and then going over what our students are like and what our curriculum is like 15 years after this program started. Um, and then I'm going to share some examples of things that have happened in the larger community, both at Smith and beyond Smith, that I think have happened because we have an engineering program and probably wouldn't have happened without that. And finally, I'll end with just a couple bullet points of current challenges that we're dealing with. So, um, as Dan said, I did an undergraduate degree at Brown University in electrical engineering, but Brown's engineering program, I, I graduated in 1991, and it, while it's changed, I think it still has the same flavor it had when I was there, with the mission of educating in the fundamentals of engineering, and stresses an interdisciplinary approach and a broad understanding of underlying global issues. So, this is a curriculum where the first two years everybody takes the same circuits class, whether or not you're an electrical engineer, the same thermo class, the same fluids class, no matter what you're going on. And you'll see, that's what we do at Smith, I think Swarthmore is a lot like that, but the idea behind this is a very general, deep understanding of fundamentals of engineering. And at Brown, you go on to be more specific in your junior and senior year, as I did. Um, I, was, I, I really found out I loved electrical engineering. I would have never guessed that on day one of college. Um, and I was also interested in biomedical engineering, which you'll see comes about when I went to look for graduate school. I visited a few graduate schools, and when I went and talked to people in electrical engineering at MIT, I found out a lot of them worked on the auditory system, which at the time sounded really neat to me, and still is. I had been working on a little speech recognition stuff at Brown as a junior and senior, and I found out all this math that I really enjoyed was used to describe sound flow through the ear, and it was used to describe neural transmission in the brain, and I thought, what a neat way to continue this. And then, that year I visited, turned out MIT was starting a brand new program in speech and hearing sciences within this funky division called HST, Health Sciences and Technology, which happens to be joint with Harvard, so my PhD is a mouthful to explain. But long story short, all my professors at Brown thought I was crazy to go into this this department. They said, if you want to teach in engineering, you better go into EECS there. Everybody knows what that is. But the folks starting this program just made it look so interesting. I got to take anatomy at Harvard Medical School and take cadavers and learn everything about the head and neck and all the cranial nerves. I got to shadow physicians in hospitals and understand what are the problems of, with speech and hearing that they're working on. And I'm really glad I chose this path, but it was definitely um, an unusual one, especially at the time. So. They do a great job integrating engineering with medical uh, science and problems. And then toward the, I graduated and I stuck around um, doing a postdoc. I did what you're not supposed to do. I did a postdoc at the same institution with the same people, largely because my husband was finishing his PhD and our daughter was born right when I graduated. So 
it just worked out, and I think it worked out fine. I was really enjoying um, the work I was doing. I got to teach some classes at MIT, and I found out I really enjoyed teaching. And um, then I found out about this job at Smith, and I wasn't necessarily looking for a job, but everything just fit in place, and I thought, what a neat opportunity, and I'll tell you about that in a little while. But this is the third institution that really has influenced me in terms of engineering science, fundamentals of engineering, but also their mission, which is to provide women with the best education available in the liberal arts and sciences, and I'll come back to some of that as well. And I thought I should put one slide up about my research just so you all know where I come from and what I do in addition to the things I'm going to mostly cover today. So at Smith, I'd say I have three major um, foci. One is involving undergrads in student research. So I've done that um, ever since I arrived there, and it's one of the favorite parts of my job. I always have summer students, I almost always have thesis students, and it's, it's just really fun. And the two projects that are active right now, I'm generalizing them quite a bit here, one is measuring reflectance in primarily normal ears of all ages, um, including very young babies, to detect middle ear pathologies. And where I think this measurement is going to be the most useful is when newborns have newborn hearing tests and screening, a lot of them don't pass due to fluid in their ear that clears up quite quickly. And this, um, we've done a lot of work on measuring in this, um, making this measurement in babies as they're born and fail their newborn hearing screening. And this is going to be a way to detect fluid, which is a much better thing to have than other types of hearing loss at that age. And then the other major project is using a non-invasive auditory response. And I'll just tell you it's called DPOAEs. I won't go into what those are. Um, but we can measure their magnitude and angle. This is actually a function of frequency. And as I said, they're non-invasive. In fact, they're used to monitor hearing in people who can't respond. Um, <clears throat> neurologists are really interested in developing non-invasive meth non methods to measure intracranial pressure or to monitor when intracranial pressure changes in war. This is a big issue. It turns out it's a big issue in space, so long-term um, space flight we're seeing problems with intracranial pressure. So there's lots of different areas where people are interested in non-invasive ways. If you put somebody on a tilt table and turn them upside down, you can increase their intracranial pressure. So this is how we started looking at this. It's come a long way since then. Um, and I think I'll just leave you with this idea that we, we probably aren't going to be able to use this measurement to say that's the millimeters uh, mercury change in intracranial pressure. But we can detect changes, and you can get a sense of that where there's a systematic change between what's in blue when the person's upright with this response and what's in green when they're not when they're tilted and same thing over here on the face. So these are the kinds of things we're doing with undergraduate engineering students in my lab at Smith College. And then Smith College in general is a fairly large liberal arts institution. We're in Northampton, Massachusetts, which is about 100 miles west of Boston. Um, we were founded in 1871. It's the largest liberal arts college for women. Um, it's a residential campus. Almost every student lives on campus um, while they're there. We have 2,800 students, 300 faculty, and 50 academic majors. Um, so within these 50 academic majors, in the late 90s, a group of math faculty, physics faculty, and our current president at the time, Ruth Simmons, had conversations about potentially starting an uh, engineering program at Smith College. And while they were having these conversations, I was back finishing my PhD and doing a postdoc, and I had no idea these things were going on. But one day, I opened up the newspaper, and I saw this headline. And I, I, I remember seeing this, and this was my ticket to, I should keep an eye on what's going on out there at Smith College. So this was 1999, and what you see is their big motivation at the time to launch an engineering program was because women are so poorly represented in engineering. And as a women's college, we spend a lot of time talking about what can we do to advance women. And this is one area that they identified. Um, and we had a very strong president at the time in terms of supporting us. So I saw this, and I had, a, I had an eye on this. I didn't really know where it was going to go. Back at Smith, once they made this announcement, once the board of trustees approved it, um, I'm not quite sure of all the order, but they got a generous gift of $7 million from Harvey Picker, um, whose wife had been an <coughs> alum of Smith's, and without that, I'm not sure they could have started this program. Once they agreed to start it, they went to search for a founding director of the Picker Engineering Program. 
And that founding director, some of you may know, some of you may have interacted with him, Domenico Grasso. So he was hired in 1999 to figure out how to pull this off. And um, a year later, he put out advertisements for junior faculty positions, and I applied for one of those, having no idea if this was going to be a good match. I can remember driving out there for my interview, and I was really just checking it out. And I can say that he is the reason I went there. He had this vision for this program of integrating engineering within the liberal arts, um, getting more women excited about engineering, but genuinely wanting to include what we maybe call wicked problems, hard things to think about. How are we going to address a lot of the sustainability issues within our the world that we're coming into. And he wanted, I remember him saying to me, I want these ideas in every class we teach. And I'm not sure we actually do that, but we certainly try to do that. And his definition that we've, it's grown to some extent, but back then he talked about engineering being more than just design, but application of math and science with design in it to serve humanity. And that part I underlined to serve humanity, he was very passionate about. Um, and I think his vision for this program really has a lot to do with where we've gotten today. So with that background, so, so he hired five of us between 2001 and the next year to be junior faculty. And we, you'll see a little later in the talk, we've grown now to 12 faculty members. But I started in January of 2001 when our first graduating class were first years. So there were three of us that year. And then there were six faculty members the following year. And we've grown. Um, somewhat since then. And as I said, Smith College, I think, really started this engineering program due to the lack of women in the field. So that's one important reason to have engineering at Smith. But every faculty member um, is also passionate about the idea that we're at this liberal arts institution, and there's a two-way street. So um, I'm going to talk about three different bullets about why engineering fits so well at Smith. One is the women in engineering. The next, and, and I, I know I don't really need to tell you all this because that's why we're all here, right? Society needs engineers with a liberal arts education. We'll talk a little bit about why that's the case. And the third one is modern liberal arts might include engineering thinking, and that could happen in a lot of different ways. So, as I said, our president in 1999, when this was just coming out, I think this quote from Ruth Simmons sums up where the school was and why this was such a big deal. A whole generation after the women's movement, five out of every six engineering students and nine out of ten engineering professors are male. Engineers literally design and build much of the human environment. Women must not accept so marginal a role in so important a field. And I'll tell you, she really brought Smith alum on board with this kind of talking. Um, when I meet people who graduated in the 60s and 70s, they are so excited that we have an engineering program at Smith College. So here's some data from, t from the most recent data from American Society of Engineering Education. They do a great <coughs> job keeping track of all sorts of statistics, one being the percentage of undergraduate engineering degrees awarded to males and females. And um, in 2014, roughly, just over 80% male, just under 20% female. And this is actually the highest number um, since 2005. But what you can see here is these data from 2005 up until 2014 really hover between about 18, 19% and never hit 20%. And this has been the pattern going back a long way, even though lots of groups, um, NSF, other groups have thrown a lot of money at this problem, trying to get more women into engineering, and we're still not doing particularly well. Our students look at these data in their first year at Smith, and they, they could tell you probably more about them than I'm telling you now. And they're really passionate. They really want to be part of this. They really want to get more women into engineering. This is our first graduating class, 2004. This has become a somewhat famous picture. So um, what I want to tell you about this group is there's 19 of them graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in engineering. So 2004, three of them are now assistant professors in engineering. Um, and two of those three have NSF career awards that were given to them last year. So we're just starting to have our graduates be old enough to be out there in academia if that's the path they chose. I'll show you some statistics in a little while about 
how they go out to work versus graduate school. Definitely not all of them are going to go to graduate school and become professors, but some will. Okay. In terms of society needing engineers with a liberal arts education, we talk about that a lot too and try to do our best to integrate ideas of liberal arts and experiences that we would all value as part of a liberal arts education into our engineering. And these are just quotes from a recent decennial review we had that faculty collectively wrote, but trying to convince our outside readers and our college itself of why this is so important. So as a creative endeavor at the intersection of design, science, and mathematics, engineering draws on nearly all aspects of the human experience, including our history, politics, economics, arts, and social aspirations. And the work of engineers both exasperates and offers solutions to some of the gravest societal problems, including climate change, disease, resource limitations, and conflict. And perhaps an easy, accessible, good, great example of some of these problems come from National Academy of Engineers, uh, Engineering's 14 grand challenges in the 21st century. So we could all come up with our own list, but this is a list that's been come up um, with by a lot of very thoughtful people. And when you look at these different areas, these challenges, I think we'd all agree that they're not going to be solved by just specific kinds of engineers working in isolation. It takes people who can think about the bigger problems, be able to deal with the policies associated with them, come to the table and talk with people from com that are coming from different disciplines. And that's where engineers or people, not that, people that are not engineers that potentially have know something about engineering, I think will be able to contribute to these very big problems. And finally, um, there's a lot of talk out there in the media of where are all our jobs gone? How are we going to get jobs back in the United States? And I just picked this out because it was recent. This was an article in the conversation last week, May 18th, and I, I liked the, the picture there. But you see talk like this everywhere in the news if you start looking for it. I was at the Engineering Deans Institute in March, and there were several panel discussions that had these very same ideas that complemented what I read in the conversation last week. But the general idea is that outsourced jobs are mostly gone. Generic STEM skills can be easily replaced in emerging economies. Students in these different countries can get really good at math and science um, if they practice them a lot. And our students need to be equally good. We can't not do that. We need to be just as strong in those. But we need to be different. And where we can be different, what everybody is saying, this article, the high-ranking folks that were giving talks from Silicon Valley kinds of industries at the Engineering Deans Institute is our graduates need a unique blend of qualifications combining lo local and global expertise, technical and interpersonal skills, and U.S. workers need to work in international and intercultural teams. And these are all things I think you get out of the liberal arts education. If you study abroad, if you have to take classes and talk to people who aren't coming from the same ways of thinking and learn a broader way of thinking. Okay, and so finally my third little bullet here is the idea that even if you're not going to be an engineer, it's a good idea to know something about engineering. So this, I'll start by just offering a definition of the liberal arts. So subjects or skills that in classical antiquity were considered essential for a citizen to know in order to take an active part in civic life. And over here is a diagram that's outlining what the seven liberal arts were back in the 12th century, okay? And so historically, depending when you look, these might be defined differently, but back here, historically, those included grammar, that's what is being depicted here, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And jump forward to Smith College in 2016, we're a little funky. We don't have distribution requirements, even though we're known as liberal arts college. But what we have are Latin honors distribution, and students can do that or not. It's up to them. But if they do choose to do it, they need to take a course in each of these areas. Literature, historical studies, social science, natural science, mathematics and analytic philosophy, arts, and foreign languages. So if you um, want to be eligible for what we call Latin honors at Smith College, you need to have a class with, within each of those areas, and they're identified there. And um, what that does is it provides a breadth and depth of knowledge needed to solve contemporary problems. So that's the general way I think about 
why a liberal arts education is so important for anyone in our culture, any of our citizens taking part in um, civic life, knowing something about the important areas. And I had fun making this, even though it's a little bit <laughs> um, different. So I think if you if you look at our lives today, you find engineering almost everywhere. And certainly not everything is represented here, but our transportation systems, the way we stay connected online, um, the way we provide energy, our, the way we build our cities, the way we communicate, um, drones, medical types of imaging, etc., the entire medical field. All of these areas and any others you might think of have policy associated with them, have costs, have ethical questions, have all sorts of trade-offs. And for people to not know anything about the technology or be able to think about how these things have come about makes it hard for them to contribute at a deep level in taking it to the next step and exposing all of our students to some aspect of how we go about developing these kinds of technology, how they work, seems to be an important thing moving forward. So Ruth Simmons left um, Smith College just as I arrived, and it, perhaps it's a little bit interesting. She went to Brown, where I had started at, so I have this connection of not ever really overlapping with her. But when I arrived, um, we, had, we named a new president, Carol Christ, and here's a quote she offered in 2002 that relates to this. Just as the modern languages and the natural sciences came to be regarded as liberal arts over the course of the 19th century, engineering and computer science may well become, of a liber may well become part of a liberal arts education in the 21st. Smith will be a pioneer in this process. So we've had presidents committed to what we're doing, which has been a big help. OK. So with that background, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our actual program and where what we do with our students and a little bit about them. So in 2010, this beautiful building opened up Ford Hall. Before that, we were in a much smaller temporary space. We don't have this whole building. We share this extensively with biology, chemistry, and computer science. We're all in this building mixed up. And um, even though this looks like a huge building, we're actually between all of us really bursting at the seams. But it's become a really nice place and it looks great when students come and tour Smith College compared to what they saw 10 years ago. And now students coming back from reunions have really green eyes when they see what the students have today versus what they have. Um, our general philosophy is summarized by, by these bullets. I didn't put the ABET language, I just tried to summarize them in, in more user-friendly terms. But we emphasize fundamentals across all engineering disciplines. We strive for learner-centered pedagogy, a lot of hands-on projects, a lot of um, interaction among students. We try really hard to integrate liberal arts every step we can, um, inspiring a passion and an understanding for the importance of lifelong learning. And we build a sense of community, which I think we've done really well. I think our students really feel like they're there to help each other, and that's been a really fun part of this ride, too. Okay, so in terms of our degrees, we started out offering a Bachelor of Science degree in 2004. That was our first class that graduated. Um, I'll, I'll walk you through this plot. Our Bachelor of Science degree is by far our most popular degree. It's the ABET accredited degree. And so I, I know we've, some of us have been throwing this term ABET accredited around. So ABET is accredit Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology. And for engineering programs, it essentially tells the world this is an engineering program that meets certain standards and you can expect certain things if a student has a BS accredited degree. It also is, for the most part, the first step in becoming a professional engineer. So engineering is unique in that its professional degree remains at the undergraduate level. Um, there's ways around this, but for the most part, that's true for, for most people. So to become a medical doctor or a lawyer, you go to medical school or law school and you go through certain testing to meet the qualifications. In engineering, your first step is this undergraduate ABET accredited degree followed by certain exams and uh, experiences required. So we have been ABET accredited throughout. We, were, we went through accreditation. You can't go through it until you graduate your class. And then 2004 was retroactively accredited. And you can see our numbers of degrees have gone up and down. There's reasons for a lot of this. We had a lot of scholarships back here, academic scholarships that went away around here. We've moved into a new building. I think there's a real resurgence after the 
economy collapsed in 2008 of students interested in things like engineering and computer science. But for the most part, um, since moving into Ford Hall with a little dip here, we are going up. And this is this year, 2016, um, this BS degree, we gave 29 degrees. And based on our enrollments, um, it looks very likely that these are pretty good estimates of what we're going to be giving in the next two years. And we've been teaching these students already for two years. They're part of our classes. It's not like they're just going to appear. So those numbers are based on actual students who have declared majors in engineering. Okay, so that's the green line. The students make doing this BS degree. The, in 2010, we had our first group where we offered what we call a AB degree, which is a degree in engineering arts. And Every year I offer a presentation on the major and I explain to the students these are very different degrees. The BS is this um, accredited degree. It's for people who are pretty sure they want to go into the engineering field. It has a lot of required classes. It limits what you can do outside of engineering because of all the requirements. And there's good and bad reasons or you know, different reasons people choose that degree. This, this engineering arts degree has overlap in the curriculum with the BS degree, but it looks a lot more like an AB degree across Smith. It has more of those comparable number of required classes. You get a super background in engineering, but you also need to complement it with something. We have lots of things we offer them. It would make a great degree um, for a pre-med student, because you're going to learn how to think in a different way in engineering. Or for law, we have a wonderful education department at Smith where some students want to go on and teach high school, engineering in high school. This kind of um, student, that's the perfect degree for them, okay? I'll talk a little bit more at the end. We, we don't have a lot of students consciously making the decision to do the AB degree with something that matches up well with it. Um, that's still our hope, and we still keep saying that's what we envisioned, but we've probably only had a handful of these who really had a clear directive for why they were doing that AB degree. about that. Okay, in terms of our students, this is a pie chart of um, where, what our student backgrounds are from 2015, but actually I have a chart that plots it across all the years of the program and it looks very similar to this. So um, we have 32% international students, that's um, larger than most of the Smith College campus. We have 14% underrepresented minorities, which is really large compared to percentage of underrepresented minorities in engineering in general. Um, and you can see the other percentages there. This other plot is graduation year versus percent of first generation graduates. So this is another big part of our population. So blue is this for Smith College, not in engineering. So percent of first generation graduates just at Smith, not majoring in engineering. Red is those majoring in engineering. So what you can see is we are um, students who are first generation students are finding us at a higher rate than they're finding other majors. And if I had to say, I, I didn't necessarily expect this when I started teaching, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, we do have a lot of first generation students at Smith, and when they come, they, they're they really thinking about what am I going to do when I leave, and um, this is a mechanism for a lot of these students to move their families into the middle class, and they're very focused on getting that job out of college. I've had some amazing students early on, and now I understand it better, where I talk to them about thinking about graduate school, and it's just things I hadn't thought about before. These are kids whose parents barely got them through school and they're working three jobs and now they can go get an engineering job and support this family and it's just incredibly powerful to them. So um, we do have quite a few students who, who have done really well following that path as well. Um, okay, and, and I should also say some of, not all, but some of these first generation students um, haven't sat around the dinner table hearing about what it's like to go to college and how hard you have to study. So there's also um, a lot of extra advising that needs to go on, and I'd say that's one place that we're putting effort into doing a better job um, and trying to help, in some cases, them make a better transition to this different environment they're in. Um, and 70% of our students receive some level of financial aid. Okay, and when they graduate, this, this year we are going through our ABEP process, so we're collecting lots of data. <laughs> and um, 
I, I, so we do have data on all these students. And this year I sent a lot of emails out and I had some help from my assistant director who's amazing. His name is Martin Green. And we were able to get an 88% response rate from our 265 current BS graduates. So these are just for the BS degree. And um, it, it's really um, exciting to see what they're all doing. So we, we've broken these down in different ways. And I'm just sharing two general ones with you. So if we look at students who currently have jobs, and, and we have, our students are doing really well, but some are in graduate school. So whatever 88% of 265 is, um, 183 of them are in are working in jobs, but some are also in graduate school, right? So in these, 62% are in engineering jobs, 26% are in STEM jobs, 10% non-STEM, and 2% are not determined. So, um, and in terms of graduate degrees, this particular pie chart includes completed and in progress. So there's been some double dipping in here because some people have masters. And PhDs or other combinations of degrees. But of all of the graduate degrees, 71% uh, of them are in engineering, 19% are in STEM, and 10% are in non-STEM. If you um, went to our website, Picker Engineering Program at Smith College's website, under our alums, there's a little place you can click and you can see all the schools our students have gone to graduate school in, and you can see all the companies that they're currently working for, if, if that kind of thing interests you. And they run the gamut. They've, they've pretty much done everything you can imagine. So. OK. We have 12 faculty now. And I would say we're just making it with 12. I'm really thankful we have 12. We had 10 when ABEC came last time. And they said we absolutely need more. And we were able to argue for one extra position. And we, with the growth we've seen, we are also able to argue for one four-year position. Um, which is mean we're going to hope to get that to be permanent. But right now we have four tenure tenure track, or sorry, ten tenured or tenure track faculty, one permanent senior lecturer, and this four-year visiting position. Um, every one of our faculty members is really committed to the idea of integrating engineering within this liberal arts environment. Everybody has had to give a talk, not all that different from what I'm talking about today. That was part of their job interview, and um, it's really fun to be with a group of people that are all on the same page and work well together. So I feel really fortunate about that. Um, I, I, I should tell you, because it's going to come up later, I'm going to mention a few of these, and one of them I'm going to mention, and his name is Paul Vox, and you're going to all wonder, and yes, he's my husband. <laughs> so I, I went there, and he was still doing his PhD, and he went to UMass and did some really neat research there. And, I think around 2006 we had an opening and he applied and it made our life really easy when my, I was completely not involved in the search but when my colleagues decided he would be a good match for what we needed it made our life really easy. So when I say his name and you wonder that is the case. Okay, in terms of our curriculum I'm just going to talk about our accredited BS curriculum. I'm happy to talk about the BA um, at another time. Um, we have, I, I broke it up here. I made this slide for you all just to show you, I think there's really two parts of it. One is um, over here, where our students really do have to somehow get themselves involved in the liberal arts side, the non-science side of Smith College. And we give them a choice. They can either do that Latin honors distribution, which is effectively five classes outside of math and science, because two of the, them are math and science related. Um, or they can decide they're going to minor in some humanities or social sciences department. And right now it's about half and half, I would say, of how they choose to spread that out. Um, and then the other piece, and I've simplified this, but this is a lot of classes. Um, we start them with EGR 100 and 110 in their first year. And EGR 100 we call Engineering for Everyone. And that's one of the classes I'm going to talk in more detail about um, <coughs> shortly. But throughout this first year, they get a sense of what is engineering all about. And then we have this core set of classes that everybody takes. Circuit theory, mechanics, thermodynamics, fluid mechanics. Lots of labs, lots of design, lots of building stuff. They take this typically sophomore year, maybe first semester, junior year. Um, and while they're doing these, they're also taking a lot of math, five different classes in math, physics, chemistry, and computer science. 
And there's some flexibility in how some of this fits in, but for the most part, as you know, it's somewhat sequential in terms of math classes need to build on each other and they need to happen in certain orders because they're prerequisites for some of this stuff. Is um, statistics in that list? Though? Yes, statistics is in the math, it's one of the five. Um, and it's a calculus based statistics. So they also have to take five plus technical electives. So that's where they have some choice in what they take. These are typically 300 level classes that have some subset of this stuff as a prerequisite. And finally, a capstone design experience. For the vast majority of our students, this is a year-long class called Design Clinic that they take as a senior. And so the next few slides, I'm going to share with you a little more about EGR 100, which is where I'd say we teach students what engineering is and we get them excited about it. And it's their way of seeing if they want to stay in engineering. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about this capstone design experience at the end, which I think makes our program pretty special and is also a way that we integrate bigger thinking into our curriculum. Okay, so engineering for everyone. Um, it's a studio class, they build stuff, they design stuff. We limit it to 24 per section. Ideally, we'd have 20, that's a lot. It's much better if there was 15 or 16. And pretty much every faculty member teaches this at some point. So we have a lot of flavors. And so I've listed the ones that are currently on the books. Engineering and the environment, sustainable water resources, human-centered design, challenges in human health, how engineering shapes our environment, design for the future, and bits, bots, and thoughts. Okay, and if a new faculty member comes along, they're welcome to design their own, um, or they can adapt any one that we're also happy to share. So um, my husband, Paul Boss, did a lot of thinking behind his energy and the environment. He works on atmospheric chemistry kinds of stuff. But once he got it down, like four or five of us thought it was such a great way of doing it. I now teach this flavor. I used to teach other things. Um, and, and I'm going to share some details about what goes on in this particular section, energy and the environment, since that's what I've taught the last few times I've offered this. And I think four of us teach this flavor of it. Um, okay. So it's a whole semester. Of it's a course. whole semester. Yeah. And what I should say is, so if you came on board and were asked to teach this, we wouldn't tell you the topic, but there's certain things that have to happen in it. Um, there has to be discussion about what is engineering all about. And we all have different readings we like about that, and we give different readings based on who we are and what, you know, those of us teaching this probably even give different readings. We have discussions. We get the students thinking about what do engineers do. We read stuff on that. They write narratives about it. And they write, um, in my class, they write one in the first week and the last week. And it's really fun to see how that changes. And it's very open-ended on purpose. Um, and then the other thing this class has to have is engineering design in it. And that it can be broadly defined. I think almost all of us do group groups that design something related to the theme of the class. And that design in energy and the environment is a six to seven week process. So the first five, six weeks of the class, we give them a lot of background they need. We do mini labs. And then the, more than the second half, they dive into this major design experience that I'll share with you. And that has to be a part of whatever one of these they do. So, a lot of hands-on stuff, thinking about design, and the challenge is coming up with a design project that's really engineering design. So it builds on math and science. They're able to do the math in it without really know, necessarily knowing calculus, but it's not just design without the basis of math and science. And um, that's partly why you see what we pick for the project in our section. Okay, so engineering for everyone starts out talking about what is energy. And we really, when they leave, I want them to really know what energy is. What are its units? How, where, how do we talk about it in different forms? So I've put up a few examples here of some of the things they do. So they, they will know how many joules of energy are in a gallon of gasoline, and they'll calculate different units for that. And when we talk about how much energy is in a candy bar, and they calculate um, the cost per calorie in a candy bar is a heck of a lot more expensive than in a gallon of gasoline, and it's pretty ridiculous how cheap gasoline is you look at it like this, right? And we, we do readings about um, related sorts of things, right? And then um, we have a car push lab where they have to figure out how much energy does it take to move my car a mile. And you can see them pushing the car with a, a bathroom scale, okay? So they start putting things together that they're familiar with, with this bigger idea of energy. And then we 
look into, we talk about fossil fuels, where does energy come from, what, is, what are the issues with climate change, how sustainable is this, and we do various readings on those kinds of topics and have conversations about them. And we need a design project. So what we use for the design project is based on the fact that buildings in this country use a lot of energy. You can get different percentages, but some, there's a lot of um, reading that we do where 30, 40% of the energy usage in this country goes into buildings. So we inspire our project by saying, look, let's try to use less energy by having more efficient buildings. And what they end up doing for their design project is building a solar model, a passive house, not necessarily a house, structured building. And there's a lot of things they learn while they do that. And the reason we pick this is the math is relatively simple, they can do it, but there's deep thinking involved, there's some creativity involved, and they can go back and iterate around things that they can predict mathematically, then build and test, and then go back and fix. So that's part of, as the teaching end of this, the motivation for that particular project. Okay, and so what you see here is a studio space that our EGR 100 students use. And they're given this, they know they're going to get this assignment. We do a lot of little labs leading up to it where they learn certain things. And I figured I'd try to walk you through all the pieces of this without putting a bulleted list but by using a picture. But they're given this assignment in the fall, sort of middle to end of October. They're told you're going to build a passive building. So I've had churches, I've had post offices, I've had skyscrapers, but mostly we have houses. And you're going to work in a group. Um, and there's a lot going on in these that I, I'd like to point out. So you're going to put this thing out eventually, and it's supposed to heat itself up. But we only want it to heat to a comfortable living temperature, right? You don't want your house to be at 200 degrees or Fahrenheit or whatever units you're using. So you have to figure out what it's going to heat up to. You have to have a way to keep it within 2 degrees of 70 degrees once it gets warm enough. And the really hard part is when the sun goes down, it has to stay within 2 degrees of 70 degrees for 3 hours. And you have to predict if it's going to work. Okay? So what bring, what, all the things they need to do with this are, first of all, we teach them how to use this little microcontroller here. Okay? It's made by Parallax, and we do some labs with that. But they have temperature sensors, so they have to know how to wire those. And then they have to know how to read the data to the memory on this. And they take measurements outside and inside, because the math we teach them tells them how much heat's going to be lost. And it's really just Ohm's law. It has to do with properties of the insulation. So you can see she's going to insulate between these walls. So we teach them about R values. And they can actually make a model on these things based on the surface area, the R value, which is the thickness of the insulation they designed to put in it, and they can predict, knowing the delta T across the walls, how the, how the heat's going to flow across the wall. Okay? They make Excel sheets to do this. Um, so that, that's the first thing. Then if it gets too hot, and it will, and their prediction will show based on certain amount of insulation is going to get too hot, they have to have a way to keep it cool. So you can, in this case, this roof pops up. There's a little <laughs> servo in there. Okay? And you, you monitor the temperature every minute or two, and it comes back down when the temperature when the when it gets too cold. Um, some of them have doors that open, some of them have windows that open. If it's a really cold day, which it usually is in December, they which is what they plan for, right? So a lot of houses have these sunrooms where they heat up an accessory area a lot, and they might use a fan to blow some of that warm air inside. And this is where becomes particularly important for keeping this thing warm into the night. That's the hard part of this project. Um, so to keep it warm into the night, they need some sort of thermal mass that they can warm up during the day. And so we have a little concrete lab they do before this whole thing starts. And they typically either use a pond inside full of water or concrete. But they have to calculate how much thermal mass they need. And they have equations for how that heat's going to transfer out of the thermal mass into this hopefully well-insulated space to keep it warm enough. And so they have an idea of whether or not this thing's going to work. They can test it. They can go back and add insulation if they need to, unless they don't have time, which often happens. Um, and, and then they, they monitor it with these temperature sensors. They, they, it's optional at this point. They have a 9-volt battery they use to run this thing. They can put on these little PV cells to keep the charge up. Um, and I guess the other thing is they have a, a light, an LED, that they use a light sensor or, or other kinds of ways that turns on when it gets dark. So the houses all light up when it gets 
dark. So I, they, uh, they were in AutoCAD, and we use a 3D printer to, sorry, not a 3D printer, a, a laser printer to cut um, chipboard, and they have a lot of fun making beautiful designs. You can make them pretty um, carefully with that, so that's all part of the learning process. So we don't sit them down and say, okay, for the next two weeks you're learning AutoCAD. We just say, you're going to have to figure out AutoCAD because you want to make a nice house, and that's what you do. And by the end of this class, they've had this experience of making the stuff, thinking about a little bit about basic circuits, thinking a little bit about basic thermodynamics. They've heard of the first law of thermodynamics. They've heard of Ohm's law. Um, but mostly they're doing stuff with their hands, and it's really, they have a, a lot of fun doing it. Okay, so um, here's, here's some data, and I won't take too long to go over it, but here's time in minutes, and you have three temperature sensors in this case. And so here's a model house, and I'll admit this, this plot is 10 years old, and this house was just built last year, but they could go together. Um, so <laughs> you have a sunroom here, and this, the data that this went with did have a sunroom, and so it has a temperature sensor in the sunroom, outside and inside, you see there's a fan in the sunroom that they can use to circulate the air. I'm sure there's a door in there that opens and closes using some logic of what the temperatures are. But here you see um, the sunroom's heating up. Inside the house is staying pretty constant because they've opened a window or something. Um, the outside temperature's changing. And you can, you can interpret this as it really is just heating up exponentially because a cloud has moved away and a cloud came back and then it cooled off and, and they can go through and understand what's going on with this. But the really big thing, they've met the requirement in that the temperature inside their house is staying roughly constant, which is what they had to do. Okay, and this is my final slide for EGR 100, just showing various years of these we have um, during the last week of the semester, what we call Tiny Town, and we put the houses out on the green, and they have to make a little poster that explains what their house is, if it was inspired by anything. Um, we've had some, you know, a really big range of what people get inspired by. Um, it has to have an explanation for the temperatures people are looking at, so you have the whole Smith campus walking around. Sometimes we've had the newspaper and the TV station come by. And, do a little story, and they stay out into the night, and they have to have little LEDs that come on when it gets dark, and that's just the picture of the temperature. Are they tiny posters? They're tiny. Well, they're <laughs> <laughs> we give them. We we we. They're uh, eight and a half by eleven, so oh, it has okay. to fit on eight and a half by eleven. So they kind of the houses are. The houses are not. Yeah, we 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 uh, we used to tell them it had to be a certain size, but. We've taken that away because it's more fun. If they're t if the houses are bigger, it's really really hard to keep them within two degrees of seventy. So, based on the fact that they have to do that, it keeps them small enough. Yeah. No, no, they're they're, they're so just cardboard chipboard. So they start they they sketch them on paper. We get them brainstorming. Um, they figure out what they're in. They go through a few iterations. If they had longer, they'd go through more. Um, and then they program them into AutoCAD and cut them out of chipboard and glue them together and then they have to figure out how to put <coughs> insulation in and all sorts of things. So every single one is different. Yeah. Is, is it harder in the spring? Than it is much harder in the spring. And, <laughs> and mostly our EGR 100 sections have been historically in the fall because that's what you want them to take their first, you know, get them excited about engineering. But the last two to three years, We've had too many people, we don't have enough room, so we've added sections in the spring, and I actually had to teach one in the spring last year. And so it's, e it's harder for me, but it's way easier for them to meet these. So I was, I was moving some of the rules around. I haven't quite mastered it. It's, it's more fun when there's snow. Yeah. Are they using glass, and are they cutting glass? Oh, that's a good question. No, the, the windows are this, just like a, a sheet of plastic, kind of like a transparency. So that's what they're using. And they actually, we, we teach them about the sun angle, so we tell them the angle of the sun and we give them, um, we give them a lot of this information, but we talk to them about how the sun changes across the year and we help them figure out what it's going to be on this particular day. But in their Excel sheet, they will take into account the direct, the, uh, what's, where this is facing and where this window is facing and they will, if you saw these little buildings, there's no windows on the other sides. So they, they get really smart about that. Okay, so 
that's what they get their first, some flavor of this, right? That's the one I teach their first year. And they go through our technical curriculum. We definitely have a lot of hands-on projects in various classes. When they become seniors, they take this year-long design clinic experience. And um, Susanna Howe, who often I get confused with, because she goes to a lot of conferences and is wonderful and really great at giving talks about this. So if you think you know a Susan from Smith College, it might be her. Um, but Susanna Howe um, runs the design clinic. She's our design clinic director. <coughs> and um, she goes and gets these projects from industry, from government groups, and every student has the opportunity to work on a year-long project um, that I'm going to tell you a little bit about. So it's a two-semester capstone course. The sponsors are either industry or government. Every project has technical liaisons from the sponsoring unit that meet regularly with the students. The students typically go visit them at least once, if not more. They have conference calls, typically weekly. They check in a lot. They learn to work in the bigger world. And teams are usually three to four students. Um, there's a class component that includes engineering design, professional practice, team interaction, how to be professional. And especially for our students who go out into the real world of engineering, um, I think this is really priceless. Uh, she does a really phenomenal job getting them ready, and they always come back on surveys and tell us how important this was for their experience. Um, so the sponsors that she gets provide some sort of initial project proposal, some financial support, and the technical liaison. And in return, they receive an energetic student team between 800 and 1,000 hours of work from them. And if there's any sort of um, uh, scholarly work, IP, they get it back. We have to sign it back to them. So. Um, OK. And these, this is her slide of all of the um, sponsors over the past, I guess it's now uh, 11 years, okay? And we have, we have local projects with our local DPW. We have, she has lots of um, companies that you would have heard of, and these students on occasion um, make connections and then they go and work for them, although it's not, that, that doesn't happen all the time. And she's had 80 projects since we started. So her first graduating class did this for 2003, 2004, and there's been 80 projects to date. Okay, and I have to hurry up. <laughs> so I, I'll go through this kind of more quickly. So engineering and the larger community. I just put together a few examples of where I think we've had an influence in the larger community, largely because of our presence at Smith. These things probably wouldn't have happened without us. So Glenn Ellis is another faculty member. He's passionate about engineering education. He's well known nationally in it. And right now he's part of a $3 million NSF funded project. It introduces kids to a liberal arts approach to engineering. It's called Through My Window. So far it has two novels with audio books. It's really aimed at middle, middle school students, um, primarily girls. Um, a website with interactive learning adventures and a teacher's guide. Um, to date, 40 Smith students have collaborated on this project, creating artwork, producing videos, audiobooks, translating novels into Spanish, analyzing data, and they come from lots of departments, including engineering, science, education, film studies, and art. Glenn also teaches a class every spring in our education department about how to teach STEM field. Um, and then this is really just showing you some of the beautiful art the students have done. You can go to throughmywindow.org and you can learn a lot more about this. But this is their novel that's recently come out, Talk to Me, and um, I think it's doing really well. Okay, um, Smith has a, a center, Center for the Environment, Ecological Design and Sustainability, otherwise known as SEEDS, and one of our faculty members, Drew Gusswell, was the founding director of this center, which is a really massively known um, resource on Smith campus. Um, it has been behind a lot of environmentally related concentrations at Smith, <coughs> The McLeish Field Station, which is a beautiful field station, 15 minutes from Smith College has come out of this. And I'm going to quickly share with you a project they did called the Deepwater Horizon Learning Community. So I have a slide on the McLeish Field Station and that learning community. So McLeish is this outside beautiful area. Um, it has a incredible a passive building that was built on it with Drew overseeing it. Um, it's now a site for numerous class projects and field trips, often interconnected with engineering. 
Paul Voss um, secured funds for a lot of the initial instruments in Tower. It now monitors all sorts of meteorologic data up there. Drew Guswa does canopy through fall. He's a hydrologist. Amy Rhodes in geology does geochemistry in the area. And Jesse Bellamere in biology has projects in plant ecology. And there's many more up there. So it's a place where a lot of people interact. And then completely separate from that, within SEEDS, um, Drew organized this learning community when the Deepwater Horizon oil spill happened. And I think it's a pretty impressive list. Faculty got together and talked about how they could incorporate ideas from that oil spill into their classes. So it was typically um, a piece of a class. It wasn't an entire class. But you can read through this and see that all these different areas across Smith came together and talked about this. And you know, one, um, I, I won't read them all, I'll let you just look at them, but you see it comes from comp lit, landscape studies, math, study of women and gender, economics, philosophy, biology, and engineering. And these faculty members came, to came together a few times and then brought these things to their class. Okay. Um, this year we have a new thing going on at Smith called the Design Thinking Initiative. It's being co-led, Oriana Mikic, one of our professors in engineering, and we hired um, Zaza Kabiodondo, um, who has a PhD in learning sciences, she went to Wellesley. I, I know she was a Wellesley undergrad. And um, they are starting up this design thinking initiative. They have a maker space on campus, again, with the idea of people being able to just go in there. It's not tied to engineering very purposefully. It's not supposed to be engineering. Certainly, it's influenced by engineering. Engineers are welcome to go there. But the idea is to introduce design across Smith in a much broader way than just engineering kinds of design. Okay, and then we've had things come out of our classes that have really just been about engaging the community, taking things past the classroom to have an effect on the bigger community. So the EGR 100 stuff I showed you, um, a group of three students around 2009-2010 went uh, a neighboring town called West Hampton was building a library. They were reconfiguring a very old Parsons building into a library, and these students got involved in the community. And um, really high-ranking um, architects from Boston came in to do this design, and these students were able to have an effect. So originally, they were going to put this piece of it on stilts, okay? And these students said, well, wait a minute, you're going to lose tons of heat if you put this thing on stilts. And they did some mathematical modeling in MATLAB all on their own and showed the architects what the consequence would be, and it ended up having a foundation. And they also tried to explain to the architects that one of the initial designs with all the surface area was not good in terms of sustainability and heat loss. It's much better to have a simpler shape, and they had some level of influence there. They tried to convince them to put a greenhouse on because this is facing the sun, but they lost that. It was too expensive. Um, and, and a year later, um, this was the old Parsons building. This is the new beautiful library in the back. It, it got written up in our local paper, and I'll just share. One of the students, Katie McKenzie, who graduated from Smith, now working in San Francisco mechanical engineering firm in San Francisco, remembers there was talk at one point of putting the library up on stilts. That idea was rejected once the team realized how much heat would be lost. But they really did the work and showed the architects. So they got some nice press for all the work they did on that. Um, this semester, my acoustics class tried to make some measurements in what's notoriously known as a horrible space to have conversation. It's like this, and you get 300 faculty in there. Um, it, it's, it's a great space called the Carol Room for one speaker to talk, but we often have faculty retreats in there, and anyone over the age of 40 can't hear a thing because of all the reflections. So we analyzed this room and sent a memo further up, and we'll see what comes of it. Um, a student from 2013, Sunita, took what she learned in our 388 class, photovoltaic and fuel cell systems, and she designed and installed a photovoltaic array to power a library in her hometown of Nepal. And she received um, a nice grant to finish that up. Um, we've had a lot of students working with another faculty member, Denise McCann, on retrofitting Smith buildings and making them more energy efficient and doing a lot of modeling of that kind of stuff as special studies. Um, so the picture of, of where we've influenced the larger community. And finally, a couple current challenges, um, for lack of a better word. Um, things that our faculty are spending quite a bit of time talking about right now are what I spoke of earlier, our BS and our AB <laughs> pathways. Because 
what, what's really happening isn't our dream for what that AB degree is. What's really happening is students who struggle with the BS and can't do all the requirements um, are finding the BA toward the end, and that's not really what we want to be happening. So we're struggling with figuring out, um, it, it kind of ties back into here, how to help those students earlier and get them the help they need so they can actually get the BS degree, and leaving that AB degree for the students who want it for the right reasons. Um, and then we're also struggling with the fact that our EGR 100 enrollments are more than we can really handle. So in the early days, we had a lot of students coming from outside majors of engineering, sophomores, juniors, seniors, taking it just out of interest. If they're doing an environmental concentration, they can take that to count for it. And we're having to turn most of those students away because we just don't have enough seats right now. And that's working with the administration to help them figure out how important this is to them. But right now, um, we're really serving our students and we're not doing such a great job in the classroom of serving the broader